13 Questions by Man Transcending Manhood in the Digital Age Welcome back to another episode of 13 Questions. Uh, This time we are joined again by Jared Murphy. This is going to be our second uh, repeat guest in the show's history. Uh, The first one was uh, Darren Grimes, which was episode 108, which if you reduce it nine, reduce it down numerologically, you get nine, which is a multiple of three and three is the Trinity, which is, I don't know, synchronistic, I guess, for that to be uh, the first redo guest of the show. But uh, before we get into the interview section, I have with me, uh, as always, Adam Loyal. Adam what's happening not much yeah another nice little synchronistic uh double dose here of uh repeat guests so that was kind of fun to see them stack up and yeah this was a this was a a really fun one really good one uh really nice to kind of tread some old ground and a lot of new ground with uh with jared so yeah it's a little bit of a different format i think uh we'll be doing this more in the future if we have repeat guests but uh, jared actually reached out to me because he's got an event that he wanted to uh promote and so he wanted was interested he wanted to see if he could come back show and talk about it and this was just like literally a day before or after darren had said that he wanted to come back on the show so it was just weird how all the things kind of fit together so uh yeah this is a divine timing uh, for sure, right? <laughs> yeah, and this is a, a nice low sodium version. So we've, you know, we transition out of, uh, you know, one of the previously asked questions, and then start treading some uh, tilling new ground. Yes. Uh, so it, I think it was a lot of fun. Uh, kind of a different pace, a little bit more relaxed, or maybe I'm just feeling more relaxed because we do have over a hundred episodes now. And they are all free. It's, it's changing the questions up and the format. You know, you're feeling a you're feeling in a new groove. Yeah, I gotta keep myself on my toes, keep it challenging, keep the listeners interested, and all that good stuff. Um, but what we will uh, continue to do, obviously, is our gratitude segment. We can't get away, can't uh, can't do away with that. So uh, we have a jingle for that, don't we? we have it. Gratitude. So my gratitude is the extremeness sometimes of life. You can look at it as downs in the sense that uh, obviously not the largest hardship, but you haven't eaten in a day. You know, it's been 24 hours since you got a meal. Your stomach's hurting. You're absolutely starving. All you can think about is food. But at the same time, When you sit down and you have that meal, like it's so much better. There's so much more focus on what you're doing instead of offhandedly eating while you're watching a Netflix. And so, yeah, it's just being appreciative of those things that give you greater things, but in the moment, uh, aren't quite so pleasant, but Without it, you, you can't have that that other uh, blissful experience. So I don't know what that is, but it's that uh, that space between that that hardship, that non want, and the finally getting, and then the experience that it brings. A release, yeah. I like that you mentioned you tied it in with eating and and. 
kind of multitasking a little bit because sometimes like i don't know like when we're having lunch or breakfast or whatever we like to watch something on our phones or a quick youtube video i know i'm guilty of that but i've been finding myself recently trying not to do that like just sitting down by myself and just eating like enjoying my food and noticing how it tastes and enjoying that aspect of it slowing slowing down so i like that you brought up the, the food thing because that's something that i've been kind of paying more attention to recently but uh yeah my my gratitude had to do with uh actually uh a i guess it stemmed from a book club that i did with owen hunt at the beginning of this year we went over reality transurfing by vadim zealand and within the book there are a number of tips and tricks that you can use to navigate the uh path or journey of life and one of those is uh reducing importance and this is is uh, is helpful when you're you're stuck on uh, getting over um you know an obstacle right you have a a thing that's bothering you it could be you know addiction or or you know just a you name it right uh, if we then uh, are able to take that and reduce its importance in our mind which you know can be hard to do depending on what it is right um it, it can help kind of take take our power back away from it and kind of put things back into perspective of uh, center centering ourselves and kind of realizing what what is like what was really important like what's what's the big the big picture here like what is where i'm this human having an experience right let's kind of tone it down scale it back broader picture type stuff maybe it might uh release some some tension or some stress and uh the other half of that i guess would be would be uh, something that i don't know if vadim kind of uh, i don't know if vadim talked to talked to this point so much but uh, saint germain does and uh he he makes reference to it in uh, one of the books uh ascended Ma- it's called ascended master instruction it's book four saint germain series coming out of the saint germain press and he he's going through this discourse right and so he, he just got done kind of explaining that's uh, more or less the same lines of, of reasoning that I did for reducing importance. But then his next, oh, no, he doesn't do the importance. He doesn't because he was he was touching on expansion versus growth. I'm getting my wires crossed because I just had a live stream last night on this anyway. But um, it's funny because uh, the second half of this that I was going to talk about is, is still applicable, and that's not to take yourself so seriously. And uh, this this can be uh, useful uh, when dealing with uh, a struggle or an obstacle that you're trying to overcome right uh, by by taking take the load off of ourselves to uh, which can be a challenge too right to, to to get into any of these mindsets can be a challenge which is why we we do the gratitude segment to help us kind of get in that mindset stress kills laughter cures so make life a joke if things seem down, because if all you're doing is bringing levity and comedy, you know, anybody out there that is against that, screw them. Let them live in their own little world of misery where they want to focus on it. Just enjoy and keep moving forward. I mean, if you do that at the very least, you're going to be joyful. And in a world, if that's what you have and what you are and what you experience, my God, I mean, that's heaven on earth. Well said, and so yeah, I just wanted to share those two things because they were helpful. They were helpful for me recently and in the past. So yeah, I just wanted I'm grateful for those two little tricks. And plus, those are two great books that are both on the uh, Thirteen Questions Podcast dot com reading list. If you go to our website, we have a question three book catalog, which you will find all of the answers to which have been given about the uh, what book has been most influential on your life, which is not asked in this episode by the way because that is on jared's first interview which you can find uh, for free in the back back annals of 13 questions but uh without well i should say with that though if you find value in the information that you got also can support us and also support our guests go follow their work learn more about them and as our guest spoke so much to tonight sharing wisdom any wisdom that you gain from this show share it if you find wisdom on it share the show 
Uh, we're here to grow, and uh, we can't do that unless we share it. Gosh darn it, this cannot be idiocracy. We can make this world a better place, and it is up to you, the listener. So with that, this is our episode with Jared Murphy. Question number one, which is actually the last question of your first appearance on 13 Questions. So it's kind of a recap. And the, the first one for this episode will be, what does it mean to be a man in today's world? We are going to start with this. Or, we, we are for sure, right? Oh, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for having me on. Um, it's great to be back. And... It's a great question. Of course, I think it's one that people, I think, should consider their whole lives. You know, what does it mean? Um, but there, there's so many different ways to answer that. So what, is it, what does it mean to be a man today? I think there are very bizarre expectations being placed within a, a, a particular group of social media uh, I would I would say a very superficial group. Uh, there is expectations of some very I don't care what field you're in. I think there are some. It's interesting. We could answer. I would answer that question with what irritates me and frustrates me about society today. Simultaneously, uh, we could get into that social media crowd and this. Um, we could throw out some terms like masculinity and stuff like that. I think, though, it would be more productive and fruitful for people to hear some things that I believe are universal about being a man. Whether you have the ability to physically do it or not, I think you need to be able to change a light bulb. You need to be able to put a battery in a car. You need to be able to do some basic repairs and wealth or status has nothing to do with it. Um, um, and and unfortunately, I've had some friends be in some unfortunate situations where they've been told, I don't think, I don't think you'd be able to help in this situation. But as difficult as this is, and again, medical conditions, uh, physical ailments, age, there's a number of things that are going to affect some of the things that I'm going to say, because as a man, I have an expectation that I'm going to be able to carry my partner out of a fire. Um, I believe I'm going to be able to protect or at least attempt. See, that's the thing. A, a man, a child, anyone can try to protect their family. Anybody can jump in front of a bullet or, or reach into a burning house and try to pull someone out. The reality is it's not just a man's uh, job. It's, it's, it's more of what do you expect to do. I still like to open doors for women. I mean, not because they're not capable, but I'll still open a door and let somebody in first or if, um, and just general courtesies. I think it is important to not always complain. I'm not trying to live up to being John Wayne, but I do think that as a man, you have some responsibilities to not burden other people with uh, maybe some decent or serious or, or some general irritations you may have physically or emotionally the reality is that as a man i think that depending on your role as a father or a partner or a friend depending on the stage of life you're at and again i think as you get older you know you know if you're an older man uh, i think general wisdom and life experience is a necessity to share i think it's our responsibility as wherever age we're at for, for us to listen to older and wiser and well-experienced people. I think we sideline the elderly in general. So I don't think wisdom will ever come from that. So I do think that there are different, for me, I see all these things in that question as to being that man, I'm going to grow into that hopefully wise and older person. And I have to, I have an expectation of myself that I will share my experiences and attempt to help 
younger people not make the same mistakes or share my mistakes and they'll make their own mistakes, but hopefully they won't make my mistakes. And then at the same time, uh, you have a different responsibility, whether it's again, to your partner, your children, both. Those are all included in what does it mean to be a man? And it's showing up. It's doing things you don't always like. And also there's a lot of celebratory, wonderful things that are wonderful for some people. They may not be for you. So showing up sometimes when you think, oh, it's just about going in and putting a hard day or hard weeks or a hard year's worth of work. It can also be being, being showing up to those in-laws or being uh, somewhere you didn't want to be. But I think the whole term of manning up is appropriate in the term and, and the and the expectation that as a man, if you put a woman in your life, if you put a partner in your life, if you put a child in your life, you need to be ready to not only do some of the, if everything went to nuclear hell, you should be able to at least have the right direction on how to build a cabin and gut a deer, even if it's not your favorite thing to do. I think it doesn't make you, you don't need to be macho or be insecure, but I do think that those are all, there are general things that a man's uh, strength and abilities a lot for him in the male role. So uh, intellectually speaking, I think there's just as much to be true. And on that level, I think it can be more parallel and, and paired with any female or partnership. So there is another layer to it, which is uh, that those social aspects, not in today's terms, but in reference to holistically treating the state of being male. And it's um, not a simple answer. It could just be a misogynistic man, man who likes loud pipes and, and, and dirt bikes could have just answered it that way. Right. Yeah. It, it, in, it is kind of sad that it's not simple because there is two, it seems like two uh, dichot- it's a dichotomy going on. Like there's something that's being pushed on us to like what it should mean. And then it's what we're talking about, like what it actually means. Right. Like, and what you brought up um, about sharing is, I guess we get older where there's stages to, to, to manhood and, the ones that are older uh, have a duty to, not a duty, but, you know, it's nice to share. And from these sharing, we can pass on wisdom and learning, and which is a big motif of this show, right? So that, that ties in right into 13 questions. So I love that. And then uh, absolutely hard skills was the other thing that popped out to me. Like, you know, trade schools. Like, I didn't go to, I, I didn't go to a trade school. Like, don't get me wrong. I like the job I have right now. But there are some times when I wish I was a little bit more hands on right so i can totally yeah. agree with you on that one you know it's so funny my dad had a toolbox and as a kid i didn't know anything about tools and i i assumed that my dad would teach me when i was you know the tools look so sharp and dangerous or like i didn't know what they were but i figured when i was old enough my dad would teach me or show me and that didn't really happen too much and i'm not saying that as a complaint but with my own daughter, I put her on a chop saw and was teaching her how to use power tools when she was like seven and eight, nine years old. And she was able to run a chop saw. And for my dad, though, I had I saw his toolbox and it was so impressive to me. And it was only when I was older that I realized that my dad didn't really have that many tools. And so as I became a design build historical remodeler in the, over the last, you know, I've done that 20 years. I've been doing design build remodeling. and that includes interiors and additions and a lot of stuff I work in is 1870s, 1860s, 1890s, uh, 1900. You know, I work in a lot of in and on not only old homes, but warehouse districts, commercial spaces. And the amount of tools I own, it's hilarious when I look back as a child being just so like in awe of my dad's metal toolbox from the 1960s, thinking, boy, he must know how to do all these things. And he and his, my uncle, they were really into cars and engines, but he never got into that or did that with me or my brother growing up. And again, it was only later that I realized, oh my gosh, I own every kind of plumbing tool, everything to solder pipes, to electrical and a conduit bender. And I'm able to, you know, run wire through conduit and build conduit and wire uh, electrical outlets and lights and fans and design it all and work with leds and then plaster and you know cutting wood and building foundations and 
pouring foundations and working with engineered trusses, those are all things that were never in a vernacular where I thought that just me being fascinated with the toolbox. And like you, I never went to shop class. I was like, I, you know, the irony is I, I was in orchestra. I was in advanced English and classes until I went post-secondary to the U of M my senior year. And the funny thing is I, I never thought that shop class would be of any value. <laughs> and now, and, 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 and now I have uh, designs and work that I've done that has been, you know, showcased by the city of Minneapolis, has been on HGTV at the request of the clients that bought some of the stuff I've designed and built. One thing was on the Summit Hill Home Tour. Uh, these are all things that homeowners or clients have done with the work I've produced. And, and it's so weird to me to look back. And again, I never had a plan to own every tool that would have been so useful to me if I had gone to shop class. On that note, I may have mentioned this. Uh, I went to high school that was very famous for theater. And the reason was, is the director was well connected with the Minneapolis St. Paul theater world and commercial world. And so I learned how to do set design, run a, r- run a circular saw, and do things on sets in high school that were sold out theater shows for high school students. They were sold out shows. And I was learning from the set designers of the Guthrie, the Children's Theater, and the lighting designers, the special effects people. We were building snow machines. So I'm working with chicken wire. I'm building fake cities, scrims, learning how to light and backlight. And I never thought that that would be applicable to design build. It's exactly what it is. And I never went to shop class, but there I was for two theater seasons working with absolute professional magic makers. I had no idea. That speaks to uh, an aspect of creativity, I think, too. Like being able to, and it doesn't have to necessarily apply to you know building necessarily but being being creative in in any capacity you know maybe you're good at drawing right maybe yes you know it could be you know whatever it is but bringing something into existence i think that is is something that is a a very masculine kind of attribute and uh it's it's a healthy uh form of self-expression too right Right. That it is creative, even for those that like, well, I build dressers, I'm not creative. And it's like, well, no, it's a beautiful dresser. And you think because you're running a power tool that you're not creative, but you know, I rip boards all day on a chop saw or on a table saw. And you know, there's those things as a man where there's always something that startles everyone or, or, you know, you're not always, you're never not going to be afraid. It's just how you handle it. There's really, like you said, there's just not an easy answer anymore. You know, there's some in the stereotypes of answering what makes a man a man today. It's what really makes a man always. And that there's just a genetic difference between our our male, female. And the differences are shown in that, you know, we're pretty much jumping out of the room ready to hunt, kill and spearfish and build things and you know there might be of course with my it's not aliens background i i might have some theories on that i don't think we evolved to where we are today from cavemen i think we devolved partially into cavemen we paralleled with some existing cavemen meanwhile i think a more advanced human race was probably at it for a few hundred thousand years longer than we're thinking but a man's job or who a man or what a man is is like a woman or anyone, like any human, any human being has limitless possibilities. But as far as a man's sociological, uh, general, stereotypical role, there is some truths in, you know, carry your family out of the fire and try to protect and 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 hunt and kill. And, and maybe that's only to the grocery store and foraging only really means for money. You know, forge that paycheck. Get there. Yeah. Breadwinner, yeah, right. Uh, right. Go to the grocery store, get the bread. You know? <laughs> yeah. Now, now it's been simplified a little bit, so you can't really say it's a man's job. But you know, it doesn't mean you can't have feelings or be sensitive. It's just, 
I, it, it's, I think every human being could be more courteous. So I don't really think that's a, a role responsibility. It's a, um, not everyone's designed for leadership, but I think all of us can lead ourselves. And that, that might be deceptively cliche, but I do think it's everyone's responsibility to mind themselves and, and that they treat others like they want to be treated. It just seems so black and white and so easy, but so difficult in execution. Well, and tying into that, what I really like is just that sharing of wisdom, trying to give people shortcuts, you know, as you age, you know, not wanting to have other people make the same mistakes, but really doing that, if we all really, really participated in that, uh, just the amount of just, just good that would come. And especially when it's just like creativity, like you were saying, expressing your creativity while you worked on this set with people that were expressing their creativity, you learned from them and it informed something completely different through their expression and made something else. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, it kind of comes down to that old, you know, uh, you know, be honest and truthful with yourself, follow your passions and help others. Yeah, I do. I do think that's important because for those out there that don't think they make a lot of mistakes, it's like you sharing your mistake could lead, you know, the next Nikola Tesla to not make that mistake. And the next mistake could be like the cure to cancer. I mean, I'm, I made, made a couple leaps there really far, but the reality is that uh, the willingness to share and the willingness to hear and listen are two separate, incredibly difficult and necessary abilities. Yeah. Point out the potholes so we don't have to uh, crack a rim, you know, (laughs) you would hope, but unfortunately there's a number of national chains that will never go to business. (laughs) Yeah. If we can give you, if if, if anybody can get a a leg up by listening to anything that we have here, has said on this show, on this episode or whatever, you know, I think that is a, to me, that's a job well done. You know, if we can pass on a little bit of practicality that someone can in- integrate into their lives from something they heard here, I think that would be wonderful. But speaking of uh, the next question uh, is a new one that I kind of came up with myself and it was kind of inspired uh, off of the, the courage question, which listeners can go back and listen to on your first episode but this one is uh, what is the most bittersweet thing you have ever done or seen in your life and you can take your take your time to think about it it's not it's pre-recorded so we got plenty of edit points if we need them so well i know it's kind of um, a weird question well there's a thing it's a it's a it's so funny. I think I gave up a long time ago. The older we get, the most this or the most that, or it, it, it always seems cir- circumstantial. You know, where are you in your life? What if, if you were self actualizing? You know, how does it relate to where you are now currently? Or, or maybe at some point in your life, you felt you had more meaning. I was like how the sports and the jock types are these popular kids who aren't anymore. You know, their best days are behind them in high school. And it's like, really? Um, but you know, there's this, I, I think a perspective on, you, you, you know, when you define what was the most bittersweet, it's like, okay, well, what's the juxtaposition of the, how much anger, angst, defeat and success? Like what's the, what, 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 what is the greatest span between, you know, when you think, you know, this, this bittersweet moment, I mean, how do, how do you really calculate that? as an ever. So it's like, I'm going through my head going, well, there's times I've been this conscious and there's times I've been this conscious, but I thought this was bittersweet. But if I scale the two together, they might equalize or be opposites in reference to if I'm that conscious and make this mistake, that was this big of a deal when I was this conscious. And so I think bittersweet, I think it was interesting to move on from high school into college. I was playing the violin so well that I had, a, I had really moved up and was working with someone with a prof- who's in a professional orchestra and uh, a very big, famous, you know, it, I, I was on my way to being able to ultimately audition. And I think buying my first two duplexes when I was 19 
on a contract for deed. I didn't realize what a big deal that was. And so I don't know if it's one of the great ironies or bittersweet, but I had the success in moving away from orchestra as maybe a potential future as a profession into owning real estate. And although that was great, uh, within a year, I didn't know what I was doing yet. And we had a fire. It was small. And I kind of freaked out and I ended up uh, quitting the contract and and releasing the properties back to the original owner. And I look back and go, I, I of course, went on to do a lot of other things, but I often wondered if in releasing myself from those properties after a year, if the right thing to have done was to stick with the music. And by not sticking with the music, I did move on. I ran and booked uh, bands at a very famous local establishment for almost four years and wrote my first book and planned to, of course, continue to write and explore. And I didn't know it would get me to It's Not Aliens, you know, or notaliens.com. I didn't know it would get me here. But I guess if you call looking back and not knowing at the time, you know, you quit one thing to start building a real estate, in my case, real estate as a passive income in order for me to write books and make movies. And so I... I put down something. I, I every day I think about playing the violin, and uh, and yes, I still have my Hoff violin. I still practice. I've been practicing more and more in the last couple of years. So for me, on one hand, there's this need and desire to connect with music on a lot of different levels, not just classical, but like uh, contemporary and like modern music. But I think that it was bittersweet to look back and go, "Wow, I did not become a professional musician." I did not, ironically, when I bought those first two duplexes, I kind of failed, but it got me out of music, but it got me into managing a whole music venue, writing my first book. And 11 years later, I ended up owning multiple real estates, buildings, historical remodeling for 20 years and owning every tool you can imagine, and having a skill set that I think I've added conservatively to be over 220,000 hours of vast um, design, build, hands-on from, like I said, you know, give me dirt and I'll build you a foundation to a finished home, to an addition, to uh, recovering from a disaster. So my skill sets, I appreciate now, but in retrospect, putting down practicing to play professionally to own real estate that in the end i lose and all of it turned out to be this bittersweet experience that prepared me for 11 years further to run a i think i had a decent run at owning uh some small commercial rental properties um multiple duplexes multiple flips and all the awards and the showcasings of the constructions I that I did do were all in these last 20 years. So if that doesn't exactly narrow it down to a single experience, I can't nail it down to six years of me playing soccer. I can't narrow it down to one event that I played orchestrally or one book I've written, even though I've only done two. And this third is really a re-release, but it is a rewrite. So I'm not like, you know, Jim Goodall or or a number of other authors with like or Jim Willis. I it's not like I have like 20 or 30 books out and 40 years of experience, but the um the path that I'm on now I'm very grateful for. And so I'm not trying to make lemonade out of lemons, but I do think that you know, if I could have, should have, would have gone back and just never gave up those two duplexes at 19, could I have been a multimillionaire? Could I have uh, ridden out the 2006 to 2008 disaster differently? Because uh, it really started in 06. But, you know, would I have been in a different place? I, I, you know, it happened the way it happened. And I think that I'm grateful for it. But it's, it is, I guess that's the sensation of bittersweet for me.
Yeah, no, that's an awesome answer. I think that uh, I'm glad that you brought up gratitude because that's what I had kind of jotted down in my notes because it sounds like with this emotion is so interesting because we're talking about trade-offs. It, it seems like in a lot of examples that may come up. And so when we're examining these emotions and we're, we're realizing that, uh, you know, it's some good mixed with some bad, but if we can send gratitude towards it, and appreciate it and you know maybe it makes it a little bit better it makes maybe it takes a little bit of the bitterness and makes it a little bit more sweet and, it, and i love like like i said like you brought up the gratitude adam and i have a gratitude segment that we do in the intros to kind of get the heart and brain working together get the coherence connected moving in the same direction so yeah i think that i think that was a great answer and um yeah i'm excited to see what uh, what this question holds for the show in the future as a as an addition to the uh, you're my guinea pig, so <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to. You're gonna have to record this then and see how it morphs for everyone else. Oh yeah, yeah. Just like you know, take that, you know, try to pile up all the answers for just that question. It's it's this whole thing is such like there's so much like anthropological studies breakdowns like perspectives angles you can take to look at it with all the questions and yeah it's like a smorgasbord like of of any 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 listeners out there want to take that on you know. And, and add some value to the show absolutely or make chapters or because you know the questions are changing i think we've changed them three times the, at least the order if not just the uh with the additions too so yeah this is absolutely a work in progress to working so yeah you know it's exciting it is a it morphing is. guinea pig huh. bark bark <laughs> but, all right <laughs> that brings us to question number three what institution of society or structural aspect of modern human life would you, or modern life, would you change given the chance? I guess human life. I'm going to put that on there. Uh, you, you do you want to narrow that at all, or it doesn't, you want it to be that broad? Uh, societal, let's keep it, uh, keep it broadly society, like on those that are entire, our, the, it's an easy one. It's our entire education system. Period. There's, there's not even, a, I mean, we could go into, I've wanted to write a book on it. The reality is that if we wanted wise, discerning human beings that were not designed literally by um, a number of foundations, outright mission statements to create worker bees from the age of the industrial revolution, you need to have compliant, happy people that are willing to put um, screws and do repetitive processes that are mindless and in order to have a compliant, obedient, uh, unthinking society, you have to have a completely, absolutely useless education system. Uh, by the time you're out of high school, you should be a Greek god. You should have all the physical attributes of a decathlete. You should have the best information about positive gene expression and how you should eat, exercise, wisdom is different than memorizing tables. And the reality is that if we had the education system that created um, those kind of individuals, th that is the start of everything that this world needs, hands down, whether it's cures for diseases or your own self-preservation. The reality is that uh, it starts with a ludicrous educational system that there's no going around it, that it is the source of our social cancers. I would, I would agree with you. And I think a lot of the past guests would agree with you. This is actually a very popular answer to this question. It and is the I, answer to the question. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that we've had anybody that, that uh, has said anything good about the education system on no. any questions. I don't think so. No, but it's, um, it's so obvious. I mean, you you can't, you have a class about health. No, you know, live eight hours a day in health or ten hours a day in health. Not tell kids what's you know. Don't give them any pertinent information about their mitochondrial DNA, but give them tater tots at lunch. You idiots. I mean, it's the entire system is not based on uh, producing wise, independent, discerning, and Greek like individuals. It's, and again, I'm saying that because we're Western culture, we should be, you know, melding the East and the West 
herbal medicines, you know, d- doing the uh, cures like like the whole um, homeopathic remedy, Chinese and Eastern medicines. It it, it should all be combined, and uh, yoga should not be an option in gym class or or, or meditations. There's just a lot of things that are not. It just it just makes no sense unless you're producing sheep and mindless, unthinking, you know, just basically human robots. I mean, it's just. Yeah, I'm glad that you clarified it with the Western, the uh, the Western education system, because I'm not too sure how it works in all over the world. Right. I'm, I don't know everything, but yeah, I imagine that there's some some pe- some group has got it more figured out somewhere than. Well, I mean, if we're going on modern, it, just on modern test results, I mean, you know, if we're going to compare ourselves to the other idiots being produced around the world, the reality is there's a lot of countries that look a heck of a lot smarter than ours. If we're going to go by on country-based uh, output of information, the reality is that we are not doing well <laughs> on that race. And I wouldn't really want that comparison. I, I wouldn't want to win. I want the Sophocles, Socrates, Plato, Solon, and then I want all the Eastern, you know, way beyond uh, art of war. I would very much like us to reach back into, you know, the hero with a thousand faces. I would like some Joseph Campbell, power of myth, serious uh, look at the world's uh, foundations rather than a particular religion or a uh, a particular mythos, you know, I don't want to hear one word thing about a Zeus God versus a Greek, you know, Greek Zeus, whatever. I don't, I don't, Roman. I just don't uh, think we need to just hover there as a starting point when we have megalithic ruins and ruins underwater that weren't above ground less than 50,000 years ago. I think we really need to cut short our, our, our evolution story about how we were all monkeys 50,000 years ago, because that's just a complete lie. And an untrue statement. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, I agree with you hundred percent. It's really hard to find those types of topics brought up and discussed honestly within academia, which is why we need to create them and have those conversations ourselves. Like you're you're about to put on a, a talk that we'll get we'll mention later, but you research this stuff kind of stuff all the time as far as like what we're missing out of our past that is so important to to be able to have to put us in perspective to be able to understand where where we are right now which is you know i'd say pretty important <laughs> yeah well what's the next question the next question is actually one that adam came up with and that is question number 4 what haunts you if if anything mm. so i like to hear oh that's a well there's some you know, when I was younger and more immature, I always thought that quite romantically, you know, you'd fall in love and you'd have a partner and you would not break up or that it would be like the person you fall in love with would be the one you were with. And then, of course, when you're a kid, that's not realistic. And then um, as you get older, you know, you think I thought when I was still going into college that, you know, the first person you say you the, the first a, you know, when you have someone that you think you love and they love you, you think that, okay, well, you know, my thought was that, okay, well, that's going to be your life partner. And so there is that regret uh, for a period of time, again, growing up Catholic, Irish Catholic, there was that regret period of like, well, every person that I don't end up with as my partner is therefore, I made a mistake and therefore I should feel bad about it. And that that was a very interesting paradigm to shift that, well, no, you're going to meet people and you're developing your likes and interests and you're going to not maybe be with the person you, you know, you really like, but you're, you're not ultimately, you know, you're not, you haven't found your life partner yet. And for me, I think growing up Catholic and very influenced by old movies, you know, I thought that, you know, you get, you know, you don't just say it, you really work on meeting that partner that you develop those feelings for. So I think regretting or constantly, like for a long period of time, I had that same, I'm not going to call it Catholic guilt, but there was that thing where it's like, well, I, and I, and it was my generation too. You know, I would meet gals that would say every person I've been with that I didn't marry was a mistake and they regretted it. They just 
felt horrible. They beat themselves up about it, that they had done something wrong by being with people that they ultimately weren't with. And that is such a weird burden. And I didn't particularly think of it as a Catholic thing. I just thought it was more of a generational thing. So eventually, uh, for good phase of life, it's, you know, your life partner is supposed to be a very important decision and not one that's a have to. It's supposed to be a want. It's not a need. It's supposed to be something that, you know, you organically fall into. And then, you know, when you resolve Those are very heavy feelings, you know, feeling like, oh, I kept making this mistake and I'm not with who I'm supposed to be with or that I'm going to be who I'm I'm going to be somewhere. And then reaching a point where you don't regret that every person you were with was just a way for you to learn and discern better who you're going to be with. But that wasn't the perspective for a long time. It was, gosh, I wish that wouldn't have happened. And then... And then you realize, well, actually, I'm grateful that it happened. And I'm also grateful for my time. And then it actually changes, I think, your my it changed my perspective on what it's like to spend time with anyone you care about, that it's never something you should regret. And it's also something that you should embrace and value every moment that you choose to be present. And because you should make a conscious effort to be present in a way where you are, even if it's not permanent knowing those good energies between you are something you're feeding into the positive energy of your life. And it's not a regret. That was a, that was a huge thing. I mean, if you've ever been married and divorced and for everyone listening, I will be raising my hand. (laughs) Yeah. So that was a, that's one, that's one angle to it. That is uh, an awesome answer. Thank you for sharing and being so honest. And I can 100% like agree or uh, commiserate with you, I guess, because I, I did have the whole Catholic upbringing and I did, I did get to uh, do the whole divorce and annulment process oh, early wow. on in my life. So, and, and that is actually something, you know, that, that uh, it takes a lot of work to get through and, and is, it, it, it can be a stumbling block, but two things and I'll, I'll share this real quickly and uh not to to ruin the gratitude that where i was going to save it for this the gratitude segment but this i don't know it's just pertinent it helped me so i just wanted to share it but uh, yeah. reducing in, reducing importance and then not taking ourselves so seriously so like when something is bothering us like whatever it is like so this thing in particular this aspect if we take a step back and we take importance away from it and we're we're essentially at this point we're taking our power back because we're not letting that affect us we're not letting it haunt us no any longer we're taking our power back and we're finding refuge where we should always find refuge which is within ourselves and our connection to to source right so and then uh i guess the flip side is is not not taking ourselves so seriously because we are we are here for a short period of time right and you know we're supposed to experience things and and learn from them so you know it's it's a uh, it's, uh, it's it's nice to uh you know let off the gas a little bit to uh reduce importance and uh have remind ourselves to have fun and not be so serious you know well and, and i think we do get tied to our relationships our partnerships and um our wants and needs and some confusion on which are the wants and which are the needs and and there really isn't anything that levels up higher than this is the person i might have kids with or this is the person i'm going to spend my life with and what does that mean you know that that evolves over time or changes as you grow and and then you have initial expectations of how you are going to grow and evolve together and separately but together and so there's a lot of meaning in that partnership I think a lot of subtext and a lot of things that are unspoken and unsaid that each individual is uh, not only reconciling the truth of the reality, but then are they aware of the reality? Are you aware of the reality of your relationship? And then you have your expectations and how much are you manifesting uh, unconsciously or out of some bad habit and, and how much of your relationship is of a conscious effort? And a mindfulness and of gratitude. And, and then I think it shifts your entire future. It shifts uh, what you study, what your interests are. You can call it hobbies or you can call it passions. They should be passions. Don't reduce your passions to hobbies, everyone. Go after go after it because I do think that those individual passions will affect that those, those answers or those awareness levels. 
And so I think the relationship one does become a, a paramount, uh, not necessary, but it becomes a paramount pillar in your time and your mindset towards anything you want to accomplish individually because good or bad partner is going to change all your perspectives and your and your mental gas for any and all of it personal opinion but oh that's yeah. mine yeah yeah i mean certainly being aware and mindful uh, living consciously like once you start doing these things like and you want to continue to do them like you can't like there's certain things you can't go back on, right? <laughs> like once you know, you know, and and then you're stuck with it. <laughs> yeah, and some people try. God bless them, but you know, figuratively speaking, I mean, it's just you can push limits in a relationship like anything else. But yeah, so yeah, there's another uplifter for everyone. Well, when you see <laughs> other people doing it, you know, tap yeah. them on the shoulder. Yeah, your turn, Adam. <laughs> What are you most curious about? Oh, literally, why are we 10 to 15% conscious and there is advanced, potentially ancient human aircraft everywhere? I mean, how, how can we not be curious about the depths of our oceans to the, forget the sky, you know, it's like, well, we should be as curious about what's under the ocean as we are above what's in the sky. And I think it goes back to education. We don't even know what we should be curious about in me. I want every question. I want the answer to any possible question we could ask now. And then I want to do new stuff to make new questions. So for me, it's, yeah, there's a reason there's 1,200 to 3,000 ton megalithic stone constructions with ancient geopolymers and genetic information within our human body that, yeah, I'm going to go speak about in a week. Uh, that 100%, I think, you can go at it a different way. I think everyone has their own questions, you know, like Graham Hancock talking about, you know, we're a species with amnesia. No matter how you go at the question, whether it's through a spiritual path or a self-awareness, I believe it all the roads lead to one huge question, which is uh, what, who, who were we before we were only uh, before when we were 100% conscious or 90% conscious. I I want to know that answer uh, because in it, I think, is everything from the cure to cancer to maybe even aging to, um, again, not knowing everything, but having a instant biotechnical access to potentially what is really the most amazing supercomputer or super connections on earth. And I think it could be collective human consciousness. And and all of it lies in knowing in in starting with the questions uh, of, of of the facts in, in the archaeology in the archaeological record that we find in archaeoacoustics and archaeogenetics. There's literally a study of archaeogenetics. So yeah, I I we have to. How can you not? Everyone wants to know where they're from. Everybody wants to know about religion. Everyone wants to know about their spiritual place on the planet uh, or in the universe. And and all of it can be answered if we would just start questioning collectively, not our selected cherry-picked facts, but all the facts that make this planet mysterious, including archaeogenetics. And, and and we're gonna see, we're gonna see that we're gonna see a lot closer to our our, our tr truth, maybe it's not a single truth, but it's the truths of of us are in, in learning this. So here's a subject that I would just, you might as well just edit it down because I will just go on. <laughs> so this would include like unlocking, quote unquote, unlocking dormant like DNA, uh, like strands. Was that kind of what we're driving at? Cause I've heard of like the whole like 12 strand thing thrown around and, and talked about before on the internet. Is this, is it have anything to do with that? I think, um, well, yeah. So you've heard of like in the paleo world, there's positive gene expression. It was a saying, and then it's been kind of proved out to be kind of real in the sense that, uh, garbage in garbage out, you know, the better you eat, there are things that literally chemically happen at the mitochondrial level. And it's something that Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf in the paleo world, and he, and, and he has a biochemistry background and 
there's there's a lot of particulars as to how you can create positive gene expression, which includes maybe curing or keeping you fortified against certain diseases or effects of aging or uh, stronger, uh, just more clear headed, or I won't say you're going to be smarter, but there's positive gene expression through just that clean eating particular kind of diets and workout. But then there's Wim Hof. So you have the, who I met the first time he was in America and you are consciously controlling your immune system, your autonomic nervous system, your ability to heat and cool yourself. Uh, these are abilities that are considered superhuman. When you see a show about superhumans, you'll learn about Stieg Severinsen or Wim Hof. And the reality is those are just two individuals that are using techniques that Herbert Ebert, uh, you know, the founder of, you know, like the guy who wrote the natural method, which was part of what move you know, Urban Lacour and Move Nats all about. So they got the superhuman physi- physiological, gymnastic, decathlete, you know, like there's these physical abilities that we can all obtain in a few months to conscious control of not only your immune system, but in a meditation, a meditation system that's not based in woo, but you're able to talk to people while you're in the meditative state, control not only your heating and cooling, but almost zen-like interaction with that maybe that collective consciousness and those are abilities that are being expressed by these in quote superhumans and then these other uh bio hacks in positive in quotes positive gene expression all of it relates to i think more dormant systems like you're referring to and we already know i had said it on a show yeah uh the day before you know when i wrote my book it's not aliens uh, Harvard in 08 had put a 50,000 word book on some DNA. And then at the time that my book was released a couple of years ago, they were up to over a terabyte on a gram of DNA. And within the last, about a, you know, before, uh, you know, not too long after that, they got to two terabytes. And now I think it's called, what is it? What, what's up after that? Zeta bytes, Zeta, Ziga, That's Zeta. Going. Yeah. So the amount of information that can be stored on a gram of DNA, and there were experiments that were showing that parental information could be passed directly to youth. So I'm saying a child's experiences, their gut instincts could actually be potentially built on actual recallable, directly experienced memories of their parents, not just an instinct that, oh, fire's hot. I know I shouldn't touch that. I don't know why. But like actually like recall abilities to say, in my genetic memory, I have the sense completely and the story and the and everything, all the memory of my dad doing this thing or my mom doing this thing. And these were things that they had proved out a few years ago. So we're living in not a new time that I think could have stored information on DNA. So uh, literally what I'm saying is a year and a half ago, I could tell you that all the world's information, every single thing to do everything down to building our microphones and Wi-Fi and every story on the planet could be stored in the genetics of two elephants. Essentially, you could just have two elephants walking around with all of human knowledge and history in every language, and they would still be elephants but now we've reached a storage capacity where you could pretty much put all human knowledge in a large sea otter. I mean, then what does that mean if we've already done that? What does it mean if our collective human consciousness is tapping into partially broken zip files that contain all of human knowledge in history because we've never forgotten it. We've just been storing it through our genealogies from, you know, the, um, whatever catastrophe was the biblical flood, whatever the biblical flood, which is really the younger Dryas, which is really maybe a leftover from Mount Toba, 75,000 years going off. So the reality is genetically speaking, our, uh, various, uh, I think our heads are starting to pop up and go for up because of these superhumans these different dietary and exercise systems, uh, second sites, uh, remote viewing. There's things that go into the MK Ultra world, into the uh, actual CIA and assorted other programs that are legit, like Oxford, uh, Cambridge, 
fill in the blank study, like, you know, the men who stared at goats. I mean, there is legit proof of remote viewing functioning. I mean, there's assessments in Rome of people with second sight, you know, being able to remote in and 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 see or be present. I so these systems are either completely all random or they're part of a systematic uh system that we have just forgotten how to use. And that's where the blurred lines are when we tell these stories and ask these questions because you know, for all the people you interview, you're, you know, and you and I, Catholic, we all have these family of origin stories where we come from and put lenses and filters on what couldn't possibly be a separate system. And I think depending on your wisdom and your discerning abilities, there are people who are, they've been taught that if you're not their way, you're going to hell or you're going to die or you should die or don't look at what they're thinking about. But the reality is that it's impossible to not consider that we have a collective large biotechnological system that was once much more coherent than it is now. And we're just playing with the tidbits. If you just departmentalize it, it's tidbits. And if we just deal with your family of origin and mine, well, suddenly we're off talking witchcraft and then somebody else is talking paranormal. And, you know, before you know it, you have, uh, you know, you have a very different dialogue about what are really all tableable facts. And it all brings us back to uh, you, you got to kind of look at all these superhumans and these abilities and wonder how does it all relate uh, to a, a, a better physical and mental and emotional state for each of us. I'm just excited about it. Mostly I should have started with, I'm excited about this possibility. I should have started with that. It's not a downer this time, everyone. You got to be uh, excited about it to be curious about it, right? I mean, it helps anyway, but yeah, yeah. biohacking is absolutely, I was just using a, a red light today to do some, to, some work on the, my insides, right? So yeah. Like, do you have one of those, do you have one of those uh, infrared, uh, yeah. do you have one of those? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I will, I would show it to you, but yeah way over there and <laughs> well have you noticed any differences oh yeah it works it works 100 percent, dude i had a few two years ago actually kind of when i first started the show i had a major uh, skin issue and uh combination of eczema and just bad gut health and i used one of those red lights because on on my arms and my legs i had really bad breakouts it was it was ugly but uh red light got me through it it, it absolutely has helped sped up the process it, it relieved uh, any itching that that might have had had have had it did have with eczema I mean, it, was, it was it was quite the ordeal like that summer wasn't uh, the wasn't too comfortable for me but having the red light definitely like 100 percent, dude it works that's amazing to hear and real stories like that especially with something like those conditions they're so challenging for every individual person i've known to deal with and it's so personal yet to hear something like that working. I, I just, it's so impressive. It, that's, I think that's great for everybody to hear because those are things that, Oh, light's light. <laughs> you know, it's not light. Not all light is the same. And the human skin, there's a 30 minute Ted talk. I reference about a neurologist that talks about your skin can see and it communicates with infrared um, spectrum. And so imagine living in a society where your skin's communicating and consciously or unconsciously, you're computing information from your skin seeing infrared, which is something that it can do. And there's a great TED talk about it for about 29 minutes. We're seeing, I can't remember her name, but if you, te- if you Google up that or internet search that TED talk, um, it won't be too hard to come up with. The neurologist uh, TED Talk skin scene, maybe try try that. Yeah, maybe I'll throw that in the show notes for anybody listeners that are interested. I'll try to find it for you and send it to you. Cool. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, that's a worthy twenty nine minutes because there's a lot of TED Talks that don't really get into the nit and gritty. This gal, I think, does a brilliant job of uh, of discussing it. So. Fascinating to think that uh, clothing and fashion could be uh, contributing to the dumbing down of our advancement. <laughs> Adam's so right. 
Like <laughs> everyone's wearing giant sheets. No wonder they got dumber. Yeah. Can't well, I mean, things. you know, if you know things hit the fan, you got to wear what you got. Hot summer day, you're not going to be wearing something thick. You're going to be, you know, sunning it up. And uh, yeah, so maybe uh, our bodies just tell each other how to advance DNA. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. That means we got to get, <laughs> hence, we all ended up doing the podcast at a nudist colony. The nudists will take over the world. Their DNA you know, is going to be the good DNA that's left. I haven't heard, you know, yeah, all right. I'm going to leave that one alone. But yes, like for the greater good, we'll go that route for the greater good. Where, where, where are we at with questions? What do you hope people will say at your funeral? Um, you know, it's so funny. I was recently thinking about that, not because I thought I would have one soon, but I was always like, who's going to be around at my funeral? Like, who's going to show up? Like, is it going to be nobody or is it going to be a lot of people? Well, and depends. what do you think? So it depends who's left, right? Are we, are we, right. have, have we gone through the depopulation stage yet? Like, I don't know. It, it depends it, on, right. What, what, what is that? Like, what do I, how do I account for that? What if, what if I do, I have an expectation. I do have some, not faith, but I do believe in that. Uh, through um, how we manage our physical bodies and also um, up and coming technologies. I mean, our lifespans could be greatly different. And I feel like we are living on that Renaissance period where we might be in a funnel where some of us make it through and others it's like, wow, is it going to be a, a general small percentage or it'll be a general decent percentage, but how many people do I know will get this as their last run on earth? And then how many of us may be on that edge where we're part of the generations that come forward that make it indefinitely again? What would that look like? I don't know if I should go on. We should move. I could, I could digress. No, I'm still stuck on this, uh, this skin talking and DNA communication and just even thinking that the fear of death could be the memory of a funeral of a parent that you saw being passed down, like still blowing my mind. It's super, it's a fascinating, it's something I've referenced for a while. It was something that I was aware of. And it's, again, if we just look at one fact here and there, you can say, well, this is a mystery. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, well, that's unusual. Or that's an out of place, out of time artifact. And there's no going around it. If you take ancient, advanced polygonal, you know, construction that is meant to control earthquakes, that's a frequency and energy technology. And then when you take, again, colors like infrared and genetics, we have I remember watching In Search of as a kid. They're like, there seems to be an ancient cut in our DNA. I mean, it's an actual uh, genetic cut. Well, isn't that interesting? Moving on. <laughs> and it's like, okay, everyone should really stop the press. If there are ancient cuts in our DNA that are not natural, and we know standard academics are willing to say 50,000 plus years ago, Denise even, Neanderthal, a mystery 2 or 3% human race that we aren't aware of. You got the elongated skulls, people, like the Paracas, they call them the Paracas, but there's elongated skull human beings all over Earth. And then you have us. And at least 50,000 years ago, it looks like Lord of the Rings started breeding together. And yeah, we have stories of giants and little peoples and all that. But well... We have a city off the coast of Cuba that's 50,000 at least years ago it would have been above water. And right now it's 2,300 feet deep off the coast of the west coast of Cuba. And well, again, we had a super volcano go off about 75,000 years ago. Well, what if, what if ever everybody was being honest? There was an advanced human, human society that was using their skin and infrared and frequencies and energies and terraforming and managing the whole planet within ancient engineered soils. And then uh, everything kind of went to crap and maybe they fought, maybe they didn't agree with each other. Then 
despite managing the lava and magma flows, they let the thing get out of wonk and maybe it was half their fault. And Mount Toba goes off in Southeast Asia about 75,000 years ago, plus or minus a grand. And then suddenly you have Denisovan, Neanderthal, Mr. Human Race, Elongated Skull People, and us, whoever was left on the surface, you know, fighting to survive and getting together with whomever to survive. Meanwhile, you have Eric Von Danigan and Buzz Aldrin, as in Buzz Aldrin, the astronaut, going down to see the miles of very precision cut underground tunnels that aren't just tunnels. They're vast warehouses. There are, are known to be some in the United States. They're ancient. They're in Europe. They're in South America, like the ones that Buzz and Eric Von Danigan went to look at. There's clearly a time or multiple times that the human race has gone underground or a portion of the human race did. And another portion got left to kind of kick sand. And it's pretty clear from the breeding record that they survived by hanging out with whoever the survivors were left. And that's got to make you wonder what would it have been like with an ancient terraformed planet by a high-tech civilization that's using pyramids, geopolymers, frequencies and energies to manage and cancel earthquakes and and literally sightseeing skin, um, I think our society looked a lot different once. And it's important for people to uh, not just get taken away with one fact that they think is interesting, but to go after trying to table as many as they can get there. Yeah, you have to look at each one individually, but you got to table all the facts and not cherry pick and go, well, this is what makes my religion true. This is what makes my philosophy true. This is what makes my Buddha true. I mean, I'm just making stuff up now, but you know, you, you really have to table all of it and not disbelieve any of it. Just table all the facts and how many overlap and what do you got then? And so just, it's just a different paradigm than our, our, our little niches that we carve out for ourselves. And I, I think we do our all of ourselves a disservice by not watching a TED talk every now and then about seeing skin. There. I got it back. That's we're we're right back. Huh? You like that? Adam, did you find it? <laughs> nice loop. Did you yeah. did you find the uh uh I think I could find it for us while we're even chatting. And just to clarify, and I know by cut in DNA you mean edit, right? Something like an actual it. edit. Yeah. Okay. So I found, uh, I found it. It's the hidden brain in your skin. Claudia Aguirre, A G U I R R E. It's TED Talk UCLA. She's a neuroscientist. Um, it's 19 and five minutes. I'm going to send it to you right now to 13. Uh, I just sent it to you now. Uh, but this is quite brilliant. I don't know if this is a shorty of it or if this is, if it, I was, I, I, I recall that it was 29 minutes, but it came right up. The idea though, the high functioning biotechnology within our bodies is, and again, I'm going to be talking about that next weekend in Salem, New Hampshire, and we're going to get a lot more into it, but you know, how can you go over all this in one, you know, here we are 13 questions, second interview. I mean, you can't handle all life's questions in one interview. Or can you? Well, 42. Can you handle it in one sentence? 42. If you could give one sentence of advice to the future generations, what would it be? 42. That is the correct answer, but the second one would be learn, be literally learn and be wise. Wisdom is not just discernment. Um, so learn that you know the short answer is learn to truly be wise. Uh it it will disallow any single branch of power, opinion, religion. If you truly are wise, you'll consider all potential truths. Uh, or sciences or 
findings. It's, it's wisdom is not taught anymore. And, and, and if we went back to that Greek center point in order to learn anything, you have to have wisdom. So learn wisdom. But unfortunately, the trick answer in this is that maybe they wouldn't even understand the question at the rate we're going. Like, what does it mean to learn to be wise? I don't, I don't even know if they'd understand the, the statement. So how do you, I'm so concerned about our future generations being so ignorant in general that it's sad to think that any question or any statement you could make to future generations, I, I, I literally wonder if they could comprehend a single sentence. Well, I like that you your phrase wisdom is not just discernment, and I think that that is very fitting because one to to discern something just means that you've reached you know a value judgment about it, but then you in order for that to make any difference in your life, you have to then apply it right, put it into action. Like you can't just think about things and then not apply right. them. So, and w- wisdom is applied knowledge, yeah. right? So, I think that's awesome. Answer. Yeah. So, I cool, good because I'm I'm still like trying to think through the who's going to hear the quiet who's going to hear my answer and are they going to be able to comprehend it and that all comes from some you know i'm I'm hoping at least uh through shared genetic descendants uh we'll be able to at least reach into their stored memories as an instinct and go that sounds right i don't know why didn't rely on our intuition yeah. My skin, my skin is really tingly about this right now. I think it's good. Response. All right. Yeah. So there's hope that uh, our DNA memory will save us from becoming idiocracy. Uh, it's got electrolytes. It's got with the body craves. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Wear another pillowcase on your face, folks. <laughs> Did you uh, want to kind of fill us in on your your exploits or anything that you would like the listeners to know about your upcoming events over in Salem? Yeah, please. Um, next Saturday, well, Saturday the 24th, I will be speaking live on some of that skin scene, ancient megalithic advanced history. I'm going to have a live lecture that you can listen to online or come and be there with me. Tickets are for sale at notaliens.com. Uh, I will be in Salem, New Hampshire, September 24th. That will be coming up here by the time people watch this, probably what, eight, nine days. And I will be then taking a break in about 10 minutes from where I'm going to be speaking. This is the second year I've gone out. It is a completely different lecture. And I will be uh, going to America's Stonehenge. And the owner, Dennis Stone, will likely be there. Uh, We will be walking the 110-acre site. There are multiple uh, astrological alignments, solar, uh, equinox, um, solstice event, um, event stones. Uh, The site is quite large. It's 110 acres. We will not walk all 110 acres. We will walk quite a bit of it. I was there in June, June doing, enjoying a morning equinox at 505 there at 440 hated every second but the sun came right up where it was supposed to um very fascinating it's an active archaeological site it represents neolithic possibly ancient cataclysm survivors and part of a network of over 800 sites that span possibly down to galt which is where i was in june also filming for a future documentary which includes america's stonehenge and a number of other Karns and mysterious things that predate indigenous groups that we know that span into Canada, that predate the Younger Dryas, so pre-13,000 years ago, post-13,000 years ago, pre-indigenous peoples that we know of. And that in itself will be an interesting uh, visit. And you can you don't have to come for that. You can just come for my live lecture. It'll be, like I said, posted. There is an event. There's an event button on notaliens.com and you can buy online tickets and just not go, just sit at home and join in. We'll be streaming it for everyone and you're welcome to participate that way. Otherwise, uh, that that's that's pretty much it. So September 24th, Salem, New Hampshire, 
Um, then the big visit at America's Stonehenge in the late afternoon. It's going to be a good time. It was last time, and that was during the pandemic, and we still had people who came out. Pretty fun. Yeah, I think I got to watch your talk last time. It was at a uh, uh, American Legion. It will be at the same American Legion again, to just hopefully better audio, <laughs> and uh, it'll be uh, hopefully better video. Yeah. So we'll oh, be back. I'm forward to it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. The links will be in the show notes for sure. And uh, yeah, Jared, thank you for for coming back on. I'm sure that we'll have you back on again. It's always fun and interesting to catch up with you and see what you've been up to and i'll, I'll definitely be tuning in to to watch that talk um the, the skin topic has got has piqued my interest right yeah well i think you're really gonna like that ted talk too so thanks thanks uh everyone for listening thanks for having me on again and um, i really look forward to uh seeing where you guys go with the show and if i'm if, if, if it evolves into a third visit you help your brother when you see him fall why do we act like god don't see it all why do we call them black them white them asians and use labels now that's racism i don't want no way 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 why is there innocent people locked up for life? While some people can't say nothing nice. Why do we always got a question with all of the means? And why won't you follow your dreams? Tell me why. The night when you took my dad. Why'd you let me see my grandpa cry? And tell me why. And why do you choose to hide? Even though you was born to fly. And tell me why. And why don't we turn from all the hate? And why don't we learn from all mistakes? Why do I keep on wrecking these fat beats? And teachers don't make more than professional athletes. And why? 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 This should be considered entertainment and not therapy. We hope you benefit from our resources available at 13questionspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.